Come to Providence Place, owned by the Sisters of Providence for retirees looking for an ideal rental setting to continue their active, independent lifestyles. We offer bright one and two bedroom apartments, a magnificent chapel with daily mass, restaurant style dining, wellness and entertainment programs, all with a friendly community spirit on beautiful grounds. Call for a tour, 413-534-9700. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real, Kathy Harrington profiles one sister of charity who's marking 50 years of service to her community and the poor. I'm Steve Kiltonic in South Deerfield, where Holy Family Parish is celebrating the completion of a major renovation to its church. And Dan Dumas has the latest news from the Diocese of Springfield. These stories and more are just ahead on this edition of Real to Real. Hello and welcome to Real to Real today, coming to you from Holy Family Parish Church in South Deerfield. This church, built some 110 years ago to serve the Polish immigrant population in Hampshire County, was originally home to the former St. Stanislaus Parish. Located on Sugarloaf Street, not far from the center of town, the church sits just down the street from Sugarloaf Mountain. Steve Kiltonic will have more on the extensive renovations that were recently completed here. But first, we begin by honoring a half century of service by one Sister of Charity. Sister Jacqueline Peliquin has much to celebrate as she passes her 50th year as a Sister of Charity. The Springfield native has a resume of service to God that includes missionary work in the most remote regions of Canada. Kathy Harrington reports now on her adventured filled life serving the poor. For 50 years, Sister Jacqueline Peliquin has lived God's call to serve. The where has been in some of the most remote places in North America. I've spoken with other sisters and why enter at a particular time? It's just that that attraction is so strong it's that time. You don't plan it, you just seem to know. On the first Saturday in September, Sister Jacqueline attended Mass with her family at Springfield's Mary Mother of Hope Church. It was the eve of her return to Canada. That is where she has spent the last 50 years as a Grey Nun, as a member of the Sisters of Charity Congregation, founded by St. Marguerite Duville. My mother had great faith. When my mother spoke of God, he wasn't a stranger, like speaking to you. So our faith begins somewhere, it begins at home. Inspired in part by her aunt, Sister Jacqueline wanted to become a nun. I just always sort of knew. Sister Jacqueline remembers growing in her faith, making her first communion at St. Thomas Aquinas Church. I think I always wanted to, but the closer I got to it, I wouldn't mention it to anyone. I didn't want people to know. Once a year family vacations to Canada included visits to her aunt, a member of the Sisters of Charity of St. Hyacinth. She was in this huge house. I always wondered what they did. And then one day we happened to go into her classroom. We surprised her and she started crying. I guess she couldn't believe it. And when I saw these children, it just, that's what uh, 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 English that's what attracted me, the children. And I remember consciously thinking, when I grow up, I will love children like these. The oldest of five children, upon graduating from Sacred Heart High School in Springfield, college wasn't a possibility for this working class family. It was 1966, and the 18-year-old entered the novitiate of the Sisters of Charity of St. Hyacinth in Ottawa. It's a time she calls lonely. I'm in another country, <laughs> and uh, postulants and novices, we did not have contact with the other sisters. So the formation, you were pretty much, I don't know, isolated is the right word. When my mother wrote her first letter, I started crying. <laughs> the novitiate was a year of studies, the Bible, religious life, and church history. You learn about yourself if you have the aptitudes, and they also study you. And after this year of intense study, you know, you, you're learning what you're getting in yourself into. Uh, into <laughs> now, to what you are engaging yourself. You know, am I made for this or will I be able to? 
Before taking her first vows, she studied at Notre Dame College in New Hampshire, eventually earning a bachelor degree in education. I never thought I was really ready. I thought it was overwhelming. Well, she met each of us individually, and uh, I said, oh, no, I'm not ready. She says, you're ready. <laughs> her parents were on hand for the first vows and the celebration. And going off to missions. So I went to northern Manitoba, my first, re oh, my God, first experience. Shock, culture shock. There was a book at that time, Culture Shock. Oh, yeah, yeah. The trip took two and a half days by train just to get to St. Boniface, Winnipeg. Because we were in isolated missions. You had to take a bush plane in. So it's a whole gigantic adventure. Oh, it would just, I said, where did they send me? Finally arriving on an Indian reservation in North Manitoba, Sister Jacqueline was posted as a teacher at St. Teresa Point, closer to the Arctic Circle than to her family in Springfield. No telephones, no televisions. We would listen to the voice of America. I thought we were <laughs> somewhere as far, far away, which we were. But the children were just superb, and where I learned community life. The sisters were teachers for Northern Indian Affairs. Their living conditions were rough, 30 to 40 degrees below zero in the winter, and bordering a frozen lake that became a winter highway and the fastest way to travel. When I was up north, the children had a hunger to hear about Jesus. The sisters prepared the children for First Communion, held communion services and funerals, and because the priest covered five Indian reservations, they also prepared young women for their wedding ceremony. There was a special connection. I loved all of them. Among her former students was a boy who grew up to be chief of the reserve. And he says, sister, I want to show you my children. So it's, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the age of a great grandmother for them. So they had five children, so uh, Linda and Freddie mm -hmm. with their children. And uh, it's good to go back. Now, decades later, she calls this first mission to Manitoba her most proud accomplishment. Over the years, Sister Jacqueline earned a bachelor degree in theology. Later, following two more missions in Manitoba, she received a master degree in theology. What I feared oftentimes was the most, the greatest learning experiences. In addition to teaching, Sister Jacqueline has served as formation director for her congregation. She says there is growth for the Sisters of Charity in Haiti, a place she describes as having great beauty and great poverty. I've been five times, so the first time is shock, shock, shock. Schools, education is great, greatly, greatly important. And even on the streets, see all these children in uniforms. If you happen to see a child with no uniform, you know that child doesn't go to school. So we have, I'm, so I'm proud of that. We have uh, one school after the program, after school, for the poor who cannot afford to send their children to a regular school. So the wealthier schools support the other schools. With churches full, and two Haitian nuns on the Sisters of Charity Council, the future is destined to be the poor Caribbean island. We have over 55 sisters. We have 11 missions and 29 apostolates. So this is the dynamism is in Haiti. Sister Jacqueline offers a bit of wisdom for young women discerning a vocation today. To listen, because this, it's a gift. It's a gift and it gives joy. You want to explore that joy, that source. Why is it there? What does it want from me? What does God want from me? Uh, to go out and discover as much as possible. Mm. For Sister Jacqueline, the joy in this Golden Jubilee year included a private celebration with her community, followed by a celebration with her family at the Mother House in Canada, and another in the spring with her family in Western Massachusetts. In Springfield, I'm Kathy Harrington for Real to Real. Marguerite DeVille, the founder of the Sisters of Charity, became the first Native Canadian to be elevated to sainthood. For women discerning a vocation, there is a website called the Vision Vocation Network to help to match your interest with those of religious communities. We have a link at iobserve.org. 
And this weekend, the annual collection for retired religious is being taken up in all parishes in the Diocese of Springfield. This special collection helps provide funds to health care services for retired religious who gave their lives in service to the church. Contributions can be dropped in any parish collection basket this weekend. And still to come on Real to Real, Steve Kiltonic takes a look at the sweeping renovations made to this 110-year-old Hampshire County Church. And Dan Dumas has the latest from the Diocese of Springfield. All still to come on Real to Real. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. I'm Passionist Brother Terrence Scanlon, inviting you to take time out of your busy day and join us Sunday morning. We welcome Father Robert White, pastor of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish, as our Mass presider, and celebrate the second Sunday of Advent. The Chalice of Salvation, Sunday mornings at 10 on 22 News, and coming up next on Fox 23 WXXA. Come to Providence Place owned by the Sisters of Providence for retirees looking for an ideal rental setting to continue their active, independent lifestyles. We offer bright one and two bedroom apartments, a magnificent chapel with daily mass, restaurant style dining, wellness and entertainment programs, all with a friendly community spirit on beautiful grounds. Call for a tour, 413-534-9700. The annual Catholic Appeal, putting faith into action for those in need right here in Western Massachusetts. Filling food pantry shelves, providing pregnancy support and parenting classes, nurturing young faith, reaching beyond bars, providing educational opportunities, transforming God's message of mercy into action. You are Christ's hands on earth. This Advent and Christmas season, consider making your gift online at diospringfield.org. Thank you for your generous support. I'm Dan Dumas with your Real to Real News Briefs. 200 people attended the annual Couples Anniversary Mass at St. Michael's Cathedral in Springfield this fall. More than 50 couples participated in the Mass, ranging from those celebrating 10 years to 60 years of marriage. David Martin has more. Couples celebrating milestone anniversaries believe the cornerstones to a long and successful marriage are commitment to each other and their strong religious beliefs. Thomas and Lorraine Morse, who are parishioners at Our Lady of the Valley Parish in East Hampton, are celebrating 25 years of marriage. The couple was attending the celebration of anniversary couples for the first time. I think it was wonderful. It was really very, Good. very inspiring and I would recommend it to anyone. It's nice after years, you know, to kind of renew, renew your faith and your love for one another. Springfield Bishop Mitchell Rosansky was the chief celebrant for the Mass. Bishop Rosansky asked the couples to stand, face each other, and renew their wedding vows. This was a joyful experience for Diana and Howard Willette, parishioners from Sacred Heart Parish in Pittsfield, who are celebrating a golden anniversary. Well, I'm the most lucky guy in the world because God gave me this gift, and uh, I've enjoyed it for uh, 50 years now, and I think we're going to try for another 25. It was very spiritual, emotional, especially to have the bishop uh, and to be here at the cathedral. We came down for our 25th, so we fulfilled it while doing it twice. Bishop Rosansky offered the rite of blessing for anniversary couples. He suggested that the husbands kiss their brides and then extended congratulations and thanks to the couples for their witness to the world of God's grace at work through their committed love as husbands and wives. In Springfield, I'm David Martin. And finally, the institution of Acolyte is the final step in the journey to the ordination of priesthood. Three men from the Diocese of Springfield were installed to the Order of Acolyte this past weekend. 
The three seminarians, Stanislas Achu, Matthew Barone, and Valentine Nuora, were instituted as acolytes during a Mass at St. John's Seminary in Brighton. Father Matthew Alcumbright, co-director of Vocations for the Diocese of Springfield, asked all in the diocese to continue to pray for the three, as well as for all young men and women discerning a vocation to the priesthood or religious life. The next step in their journey will be their ordination as transitional deacons. And remember, you can stay up to date on all the latest news in the Catholic Church locally and beyond by logging on to iobserve.org. There you can read articles written by our Catholic communication staff, as well as view archived episodes of Real to Real. That's iobserve.org. I'm Dean Dumas, and those were Real to Real News Briefs. Julia Roberts is back on the big screen. Green Book may be this year's best picture and Roma takes the prize at the New York Film Critics Awards. Let's take a look at this week's Real Culture. Ben is back. Director Peter Hedges directs his son Lucas in this tale of a mother played by Julia Roberts trying to get her son on the road to recovery after a pretty dark past. The acting is great, but the storyline is just too soapy. Young Hedges shines here, just like he did in Manchester by the Sea. Ben may be back, but I wish the story was not so over the top. The film is rated R for some language throughout and some drug use. This time tomorrow you are back in sober living. Yeah, okay. You did not leave my sight ever. Because for the next 24 hours, you are mine, all mine. Got it? I got it. Green Book is a great film, pure and simple. This film, set in 1962, about a friendship that develops between a black pianist and his Italian-American driver, played by Mahershala Ali and Viggo Mortensen, will have you cheering from your seats. This really is a film to see because we forget what the South was like during this period. The film will make you smile and cry and give you hope. I loved it. It's rated PG-13 for some language and some violence. Put this down. Falling in love with you was the easiest thing I've ever done. I loved you the day I met you. I love you today. And I will love you the rest of my life. So can I put a uh, P.S. kiss the kids? A P.S.? Yeah, like at the end. That's like clinging a cowbell at the end of Shostakovich's the seventh. Right. That's good. It's perfect, Tony. It's an early Oscar favorite. But is Roma a good film? Here I am mixed. Alfonso Caran's Spanish language memory piece, which takes place in Mexico City in the 70s, rips at your heart. But in the end, does it leave us wanting more? I say yes. But a sure nominee for Best Picture, and a trip you will never forget. You'll be able to see this film in limited theatrical release and on Netflix starting December 14th. This film is rated R for violence and brief male nudity. It's the number one movie out there right now, and for good reason. Ralph Breaks the Internet, the sequel to Wreck-It Ralph, is a great family movie filled with delightful characters like Ralph and his sidekick, Vanellope, played by John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman. It's a story about what true friends do for each other. Colorful, fun, and really a sweet little Disney film. Bring the kids. This is the most beautiful miracle I've ever seen. And you can see my reviews, as well as read other movie reviews, provided by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops online at iobserve.org. That's iobserve.org. And to get into the holiday spirit, why not check out A Christmas Carol at the Hartford Stage? This fabulous production is filled with color, life, old-fashioned memories. I'm Mark Giza for Real Culture. Have a fabulous week. You are watching Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Here again is your Real to Real host, Sharon Rulier.
As we set off the top of the show today, Holy Family Parish here in South Deerfield held a rededication mass last Sunday to mark the completion of some large scale renovations, which coincided with some recent growth in that worshiping community. Steve Kiltonic attended the mass and spoke with Father Jonathan Reardon about the parishioner led effort to beautify this church and a few other parish structures. South Deerfield is a small New England town with a population of 1,880 from the latest census figures. It's a town steeped in history, known in part for the much celebrated Yankee Candle Village, which attracts visitors year round. Christmas is an especially busy time as people travel near and far to take in the festive holiday atmosphere. About a mile from the so called center of the universe and just down the street from Sugarloaf Mountain, which offers sweeping views of the Connecticut River Valley, is Holy Family Parish. Holy Family was established in 2008 after the merger of St. Stanislaus, which traditionally served the Polish community, and St. James, which was the spiritual home to many of the ethnic Irish here. When Father Jonathan Reardon arrived in 2015 to become pastor, he noticed right away that the church and other parish properties had deteriorated. Over the years, dwindling parish resources hadn't kept up with the required maintenance. There were some ceiling leaking in the parish hall. There was windows that were leaking. There were windows that were cracked. There were, the ceiling in the church was, it was uh, literally falling, <laughs> uh, paint chips falling off the ceiling. Time had taken its toll on the exterior and interior of the 110-year-old church, parish hall, and rectory, and parishioners soon realized that fixing one small part of the problem would only postpone the inevitable. We talked about the ceiling, and that's when it snowballed to, well, if we do the ceiling, we get to move pews, and the pews need to be restored. They need to be finished and, you know, sanded down, and they're scratched, and they're, you know, they're cracked in some areas, and okay, well, if we do that, then we should look at the floor under the pews because that's cracking in areas too and the tile's loose and, 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 um, and also the carpet. The carpet is 30-something, 40 years old. It's worn out in areas. And, and uh, it, so it just kind of snowballed from, well, if you're going to do one thing, you should really look at doing everything. In 2016, a capital campaign budget of $350,000 was initially established. We've done some fundraiser type events, but it's been pledges and donations all along. Phase one, which started in the summer of 2016, included replacing the roofs of the parish hall and rectory, then painting the church exterior with volunteers and help from inmates from the Franklin County Jail. Parishioners were in charge of the project. They, they, we brought the inmates in and we bought all the materials. We provided some meals for them and they painted the exterior of the church. And it did a fantastic job. It was once white is now gray and were blue doors are now red doors. In addition, all of the exterior glass was replaced and the bottom portions of the stained glass windows were restored. The front steps were also redone and handicap railings and signs added. The church was closed this past June for close to 100 days to start the second phase, the renovation of the church interior. Father Reardon engaged the services of Egan Church Restoration, which has renovated churches throughout New England. There was a lot of plaster damage and paint peeling and it started off with the ceiling and then the, uh, we began to discuss coordinating moving the pews to do the ceiling. So then one thing led to another and we continued on through uh, replacing the carpet with new flooring, restoring the pews and painting the interior of the church through a, a group of artists that I have working for me. Egan did some faux painting on the sanctuary ceiling and also rebuilt the entire arch because it has sustained so much water damage over the years. A lot of the colors you want to take from the windows and bring those colors in throughout the church. To, they match the liturgical designs of the church. So we tried you know, some lighter tones of blue, but the darker tone that we ended up with, with the white uh, moldings, it really came out and looked outstanding. Rick Russo, a woodworker, restored the communion rails, which were repurposed from St. James with a new vibrancy. Jeremiah Patterson contributed his artistic wizardry. He spent over eight months repainting and restoring the 14 Stations of the Cross, designing and painting the niches behind the two altar statues, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary, and he created a new wooden crucifix that will be erected above the high altar. Essentially, those two statues earlier had stood in front of just blank walls. They looked sort of like they were floating in, in, a, in a nondescript space. And so they really needed windows, uh, as we say, doorways to heaven. 
they had to be painted with what's called faux realism, where they look like they are actually three-dimensional. For the cross, Patterson painted using an ancient technique that goes back to the Middle Ages, egg tempura. Artists use pure pigment, pure color, and mix it with the yolk of a chicken egg. And the yolk of the chicken egg is actually what binds that pigment to the surface of the painting. It's a very slow and methodical technique, and, um, but it's the traditional technique that these crucifixes from that time period were made in. Patterson, who has exhibited his artwork throughout New England, said this was the first time he has done work for a church. Another noticeable change was the moving of the original baptismal font, which was hidden in the back of the church, to the front. It's such a beautiful piece that it should be prominent, it should be seen. And then when, now when we do baptisms, it's right here. It's so people can see what's happening. Parishioners first got a glimpse of the finished interior back in October. From the ceiling, the blue ceiling, to the hardwood floors, to the pews, to the altar, it's, it's really just uh, quite stunning and beautiful, and I was overwhelmed when I first saw it. I hope that when people look up to that ceiling, they think of the heavens, they think of the dwelling place of God, and that they, they, it takes them away, it takes them away to that other realm, that heavenly realm. Phase three of the project will begin next spring, and will include the repaving of the parking lot and the addition of air conditioning. It's not just for comfort, but we want to preserve this, this beautiful church. We want to preserve the artwork and the paint that's here. Um, so adding a, a temperature control will help us to do that for the, for the long haul. On December 2nd, a special rededication mass was held to celebrate the completion of the current renovations. Springfield Bishop Mitchell T. Rosansky celebrated the mass with the former pastor, Father Philip Rue, as well as Father Jack Roach, Father Barrett Peace, Father Reardon, along with Deacon Rodney Patton. It was standing room only as Bishop Rosansky gave the homily. In a brief ceremony, Bishop Rosansky also blessed the three new icons to the church, the Divine Mercy icon, the new cross created by Patterson that will hang over the center of the altar, and the icon of St. Michael the Archangel. Father Reardon thanked the bishop, the priests, and parishioners in attendance from the former St. Stanislaus and St. James parishes, as well as everyone associated with the renovation. Today proves that it doesn't matter where we have been, where we have come from, that we have the ability to come together to create a new identity, making this parish community what it is today, truly a holy family. As Bishop Rosansky and Father Reardon alluded to, their hope is that the physical renovation spur parishioners on a new journey of the heart, a spiritual journey that will deepen their faith and draw them closer to the heart of God, welcoming Him more fully and more completely into their lives. As we ask God's blessings upon this building and upon these icons, may God give to our hearts true hope in His promises, promises that are always for His people fulfilled. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic. So far, a total of $450,000 has been raised for the renovations here. Father Reardon says that any extra funds left over will be set aside for a rainy day fund for future repairs to help avoid another large-scale capital campaign. And for this week, that's Real to Real. We do appreciate you tuning in today. Thanks so much to Father Reardon and the staff here at Holy Family in South Deerfield for having us. As always, for more updates anytime, as well as information and news on the Catholic Church in the Diocese of Springfield and around the world, head over to our news and information site, iobserve.org. Also check us out on Facebook as we update daily the stories that our reporters are working on. Friend us at Catholic Communications. Join me next week for another edition of Real to Real, your window on the world around you. See you then. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal and the support of you, our faithful viewers.